Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host, Brian. Today, we're going to start up the weekend like we start up most weekends with some critical reactions. <laughs> with some special selections, songs that you guys have specifically requested of me to check out. Today's comes at us from Michael Pitts. It says, hey, for me, I'd like to do a video for Periphery Loon. Thanks, and I'll be looking forward to it. I explained to Michael that I am a Periphery fan. It would be less of a reaction and more of a bit of an analysis. Um, but that Periphery 3 was is actually my least listened to album. It just didn't hit me as hard as Juggernaut, the, the dual album Juggernaut did. And uh, it kind of bounced off me. I never really went back and, and gave it a fair shake. So this will actually be pretty cool, jumping back in and, and checking out Periphery 3 after quite some time. All right. So, why are my wires tangled today? Literally makes no sense. All right. I think I just used literally figuratively, and I'm a little upset with myself. But oh, all we can do is be better. We're humans. We have faults. Let's get into this one. For freeze loon. Got a nice uh, seven beat uh, concept going on here. The delay is giving me a little bit pullback. Should I call it seven four or seven eight? I'm not really sure at this point, but it's seven pulse, and that's what really matters. Really beautiful hi-hat work that kind of emphasizes the echo that's going on in the guitars. The seven pulse has given us some really interesting rhythmic qualities in the lyrics. Got a nice pop rock feel to it. Really nice harmonies for this part. Uh, killing those uh, symbols for just that one beat, and even that that weightless waiting. String work to really give it that elegant regal feel, larger than life.
Oh, we moved the core. Really nice notes to hold. A little flourish on it. Snare's emphasizing beat 2, which is giving it this slower feel, but also for me it's just a little jarring because I'm really expecting it on a hard 1, everything else is landing on 1. Let me bring back the core uh, chord progression right here. We just kind of strip it back. Assuming this is, I think this is, yeah. Oh, it's not the end actually. Alright, so we're keeping with that larger than life theme. We got a, a big choir going on here. There's no way. Alright, so that is Periphery's Loon off of their third uh, Periphery album. Uh, I, I don't know what album that actually... I think that's album six. We had P1, P2, Clear. Was Clear an EP? Um, and then we had the Juggernaut Duality. So that's either uh, album five or six, I think. Anyways, what is completely throwing me off, and I'm actually on my phone right now trying to look this up. There is a song f on from first to last's album Heroin called Is it the Levy? I think it's the Levy. Nope. Ah oh, man, I don't want to I don't want to waste too much time here. Anyways, um, it might actually be heroin, the title track. Let me get this off. Um, 
the ending to this song reminds me so much of the ending to that one. And the interesting thing is, I believe at this point in time that this album was released, the lead singer of Periphery did an album as the lead singer of From First to Last, replacing Sonny Moore when he went on to do Skrillex. Um, and, and it can't be a coincidence, right? There's just so, the orchestration, the, uh, chord progression is not identical, but some of the relationships between the chords is phenomenally close. Um, the way that the instruments are laid out, the way that the, um, the string rhythm against the voc the choir rhythm, it's so close. There's no way this is a coincidence. Um, I, I can't, I don't know. It's kind of blowing my mind right now. Uh, I, I gotta go. It's been a while since I've listened to heroin. So I really got to go back and check that song out and like, listen to them back to back. Uh, but <laughs> that ending, the last, you know, minute and a half came in on this. And that was all that I thought I was like, that's, that's that song. That's, that's from first to last. That's from first to last. That's from first. Like there's, they're taking all these elements and it's like, oh man. <laughs> I don't know. My mind's kind of blown about that. All right. So this song is actually a perfect encapsulation. I feel of why periphery three bounced off of me. A lot of it is real solid. They, they, they're still sticking with some of their gentier aspects, such as unusual time signatures and the way that the drummer is playing with time in the way that what, beats he's accenting um but it's missing two key components to me it has the soft side of periphery but it's missing the heavy side of periphery and it's missing a lot of the insane guitar work in favor of different textures and as a as a composer i understand why they went this route Especially if you've watched the um, documentary on Juggernaut, and especially some of the post document or the documentaries that came out after Juggernaut, like um, uh, two of the guitarists did an oral history with Metal Sucks. I don't remember now. Anyways, they did an oral history, and they both spoke very negatively about the juggernaut process. Like, it, it took a lot out of them. It was a, a mentally demanding album, dual, dual album to write. Uh, the fact that it was conceptual meant that they were really pushing themselves. And all this, it was very stressful for them. And when they came off of that, they just wanted to have fun and write fun stuff and kind of change up their sound. Up until then... Uh, periphery one, periphery two, ju and uh, juggernaut all have that core periphery sound. So after doing that same kind of thing for such a long time, and then being stressed out from your prior one, I understand wanting to do something like this. I totally get it, and I am by no means telling them that they made the wrong move. You do what you got to do. Seriously, whatever kind of inspirations coming to you, you need to make that kind of music, regardless of what it is. I don't care how bands change. I don't. If the music doesn't resonate with me, that's fine. <laughs> it's not for me. Nobody really writes music for their fans. Most music is written for the artists themselves, uh, the composers, the musicians. It sounds good to them. They need to get out of their system, whatever. It's a personal exploration. If other people happen to enjoy it, then that's just icing on the cake. But... Um, but yeah, so I completely understand why this album kind of went in that direction, but it just, it bounced off of me, and a lot of that is in here. It's a solid song, it really is. I love the popular vocals. I think Spencer kills it with these. Uh, I know he has those brutal growls, and he has those really sick, uh, you know, clean distortions, and the dude can just, he has such a range, especially inside of Harshness. But I just really love when he goes kind of poppy, especially when he puts little pop flourishes in there. Um, there's a song on Juggernaut called Omega. I think it's Omega. And uh, like in the first line, 
the whole album has been like ridiculously heavy with a couple of rock ballads, but even the rock ballads have heavy breakdowns in them. Um, and like at the end of this 90 minute journey, you get this little, well, after he holds out a note for a while, and it's just like this little pop flourish in this metal album. And, uh, I just, I love, I think he's a really good pop artist, um, a pop singer. And, and, uh, honestly, I love seeing this side of periphery, um, or at least the side of Spencer, um, the overall tone of the song has a nice pop rock feel to it. Uh, the, the chord progressions that they choose, aside from some at the end. Once we kind of hit the four-ish minute mark, uh, we start seeing some more interesting, some heavily textured and some darker chord progressions and chord qualities, especially once um, the full orchestra kind of kicks in. Not the full orchestra, the full string set kicks in like around the four minute mark. Uh, that whole ending kind of takes a bit of a darker tone. Uh, but, you know, the the intro of the song, almost everything that has lyrics to them, if you kind of cut off the ending, you got a pretty good pop rock song on your hands. Um, I really love the way that the orchestra is used to kind of give that grandiose, larger-than-life feel. I think it works well. Uh, I, I've mentioned before, I'm not keen on that being its primary purpose, which is what it typically gets used as everywhere. And I feel, I always feel kind of bad sliding bands for using the orchestra or the string sound this way. Um, because like, I, like I just said, it's not bad. It sounds good. It achieves what you're going to achieve. It's just that 90% of the time, that's what happens when you put strings into pop or rock or hip hop or whatever, anything outside of classical, the strings are used for that texture to create that atmosphere rather than actually using strings for anything they're good at. They're, they're never used to actually, you know, contribute to any layers or contributing to melody or counterpoint. They're always used for flavor. They're used for theme. Um, and it's just, it's such, I don't know, it's a bit overkill, and it's, it's just so disappointing. Every time I hear strings come in, I'm like, all right, cool. We're going to get some cool, you know, classical composition in here. And it's it's never. It's always used for flavor. So, yeah. The, I mean, as always, I'm torn here. They, it does a real good job of creating, of making the song sound bigger. But at the same time, it falls into that trope. And I'm, oh, man, it's just a trope I'm tired of. <laughs> um. But yeah, overall, the song is inoffensive and it has some cool elements to it, but there's not really a lot of guitar work going on. The drums are killing it. I absolutely love the drums. The seven feel for the first half of the song is very well done. Um, it has this sense of disjointedness, but they do a very good job of covering that up. If you're trying to head headbang along and you're trying to fit in with the 4-4, which is what half of every uh, melodic line feels like it should go into, because 7, you got 4 in that 7. So if you're going along with the 4, you're going to hit your 4, you're going to loop over to 1, 2, 3, and when you're getting ready to hit the, the last beat of this bar, you're in the first beat of the next one, you get this disjointed feel until, until you're really, you know, tune in, oh snap, they're in 7, you know. But it's not like 3-4 where you get that disjointedness immediately. You never get to have that 4, so you immediately know that you're still there. I mean, uh, so you immediately know that you're not in 4. But with 7, you get the 4. And then, you know, th then <laughs> then you get tripped. You get the, the carpet swept out from under you. So, um, yeah, but like I said, they do a, a pretty good job of kind of covering that up a little bit. It's still disjointed for me. Uh, maybe some others find it disjointed, but once you kind of get into it, it doesn't take long to kind of get into the groove that they create. I will say I'm quite surprised that I didn't get into the eight though as soon. I, I don't know when the eight transitioned. I, my hypothesis is that it was when the band cut out and we switched to the, it was either the sparse section or the section that came right after that with the strings and the choir. One of those two places would be my guess of when we switched to eight, and I didn't catch it until way later. So, yeah, that's that. Uh, like like I've said before, that that always surprises me. Usually, I'm pretty good about catching 
time signature changes just because as for me personally they're very prominent very prominent especially uh yeah i don't know they're just prominent when 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 we sh- when i go to headbang and then there's not or head nod whatever you want to call it and and then there's not that last bar or maybe there's an, or not the last beat and then or maybe there's an extra beat uh it's just very very in your face to me and for it to get covered up it always it always surprises me where i'm like hey i didn't catch that how long ago we, you know how long have we been doing this uh so yeah that's like i said though there's there's interesting things throughout this song but as a whole to me it's just sort of inoffensive it's a good song but it's not anything i have really strong emotions about other than the fact that now my mind is blown because i swear that ending came from from first to last and i have to go look that up now because i like i said the 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 lead singer of periphery has done an album with from first to last and i'm pretty sure he toured and i'm pretty sure that they've played some older songs so uh i don't know maybe it was you know hey i really d- dug that song let's kind of you know tribute it in this one i don't i don't know <laughs> it could be completely happenstance and just randomly occurred that way but it's just there's too many connections for me to believe it's it's purely random. I don't know. I gotta look that one up. And like I said, I could be misremembering it anyway, so who knows. Anyways, that wraps this one up. That is Periphery's Loon. I just gave you my ideas and opinions and thoughts. This is where you guys let to hear me. <laughs> this is where you guys get to let me hear your thoughts and opinions hit me up in the comment section let me know what you thought about periphery's loon let me know if you thought i was incorrect about some things if you completely agreed if there were some things i didn't catch you want to point out put it down in the comments above that is a description box there's a bunch of links in there but most importantly it is thank miss there's just uh, a link to go to the critical reactions thank miss campaign page where you can help donate towards the overall thank miss idea which is where a bunch of YouTubers and Twitch people and TikTokers and everybody gets together and uh, crowdfunds for Red Nose Day, which makes sure that uh, kids in poverty end up getting fed this season. Very important, I think, uh, to make sure that the future generations of this world actually get to survive to be old enough to improve it. So I've already put mine donations down i was the first one on the campaign a couple of other people have already donated i thank you so much for everybody who has so far if you can't it's understandable we are in tough times but you know like i said if you i mean even if you can't even just um uh, tweeting about it or sharing links to the the crowdfunding campaign either mine or the base uh thank miss whatever whatever you can do to help out even if that's just kind of spreading awareness of of the the campaign would be greatly appreciated there's other links in there but like i said that's the most important one to me right now so that's what i'm going to be plugging for this video all right i'll be back tomorrow at 5 p.m eastern standard time 10 p.m utc with another episode of critical reactions another special selection and before that starting about 3 30 or 4 p.m eastern standard time so about 60 to 90 minutes before tomorrow's episode drops i will be doing a live stream there's going to be some crossover. The new video is going to drop at the same time I'm live streaming. There's nothing I can really do about that. I, I, I would prefer to separate them, but I can't. But it's going to be public, open to everybody. Um, you know, if, if you're subscribed to the channel, if you got the bell uh, clicked, then you're going to be notified when the live stream starts. I encourage everybody to join. It's going to be in support of ThinkMiss to help... Uh, drive donations to the crowdfunding campaign and um i think we're gonna have a lot of fun i'm gonna do some live reactions and kind of whatever floats the boat maybe i get bored of that and and we do some light composition or some improvisation i don't know i don't know but it's gonna be fun i think interacting with everybody We've done a few live streams, but they've all been Patreon exclusive, so this will be pretty cool to have a larger... I'm a little nervous about having a larger audience, but uh, like I said, I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be pretty fun, and it's all for a good cause, too. So, All right, that one wraps this one up, and uh, like I said, I'll be back tomorrow at 3.30 or 4. You can check my Twitter for a specific time. I will definitely let everybody know exactly when I go up, when I know what time I'll be able to, and uh, yeah. 
and then the 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time video as usual. All right, until next time, you guys stay safe out there, keep being awesome, and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos. Thank you.